see you tonight. We certainly appreciate uh, this is a great number. Thank you for coming out and being with us tonight. Uh, just want to share with you as we begin tonight and we begin with our prayer time. I want to share with you tonight about a missionary, and it, this is a wonderful, wonderful story here. It says it's, it's two people, Mason and Abby Shearer, are the missionaries. It says Mason and Abby are international mission board workers in South Asia. Of course, it doesn't tell you uh, exactly where they are. Uh, it said, but Mason met a guy named Deja when he was sharing the gospel in the neighborhood where he lived at. Deja was at the end of his rope. He and had no reasons or no means of provision and no prospects for work. He had nothing. A friend suggested that he, that he pray to Jesus for help. Deja did. God answered by providing money and a place for him to live. Shara said, this is the answer to prayer that led Deja to leave Hinduism and put his faith in Jesus Christ. Met him, prayed with him, told him about Jesus, saw he was having a hard time, asked him to pray, he did. Jesus answered his prayers, gave him a job, gave him food, helped him get a place to live. That is a wonderful, wonderful story. Deja told Shira that he committed his life to Christ, but he needed someone to teach him how to read the Bible and how to grow in his faith. Shara and others of the group began meeting with him and discipling him and helping him to understand what the Word of God said. So they're somewhere doing God's work, and we support them they could not do what they do if it were not for the mission work and the mission money that come from churches like ours that support folks that do these things all over the world. And, you know, for the most part, that's the most recognition this guy will ever get until they get to heaven one day and he'll remember the one that told him about Jesus. Hallelujah that we've got folks that are doing that. While we're here, they're taking on some hard tasks and some hard chores. And so they need our prayers. So I'm going to pray, and then Mimi will come and lead us in our, our worship song tonight. Our ushers will come and take up our mission offering for tonight. So let's pray. God, when I read stories like this, Lord, it makes my heart happy. It fills me with that joy because I, I see what these missionaries do. When he started out that day, he probably never knew that he would have the influence on a man's life that would change his life forever and for eternity that day. But God, I pray we have folks like that that are all over the world, whether here in America or wherever. And God, they're telling people about Jesus. Lord, I pray for all of them. I, it, it's good to hear these stories where, God, you just step in and answer prayer quickly. And, God, you did that here. So, Lord, I pray for these folks that are out there here everywhere that we could probably conceive of in the world. We've got a missionary somewhere doing something. And, God, we're helping support them by the monies that we give to, uh, to the missionary, to the international mission, to home. Lord, thank you for a church that that God that makes this a priority in their life. So, God, we pray for all of them today. I pray for their protection, as I always say. They live in dangerous places. Lord, I pray that you give them provision for everything that they need. And, God, just as we read about this man, that, God, you'll give them souls for their labor. For it's in Christ's name that we do humbly pray. Amen. All right. Stand together with us now as we sing our song for tonight.
by a man may be saved except the name of Jesus. No other name. So there's something about that name. Come on, Lisa. Mr. Lisa's going to do our, our special music for us again tonight. Lisa, I appreciate it so much, you doing this. Discouraged. Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When I know that he watches me tonight. All right. I want to continue on where we left off uh, last Sunday night. We talked about where Jesus said that time in the end times would be a time of persecution for the church. That 
in the last days, it will be a time we talked about a hatred. It will be a time when martyrs will come. It will be a time when people will be killed for the gospel. We talk about these missionaries and we give you the stories of them. But folks, there are a lot of them in this world that don't have it good as some of them we read about. They live in very dangerous times. Jesus said this in the 24th chapter where I read to you last week and we, we talked about it. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and they shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. What are we just saying? There's something about that name. Jesus said that name in the last days will cause you to be hated. Many shall be offended, betray one another, and shall hate one another. I want to look if that is the way that the world is going to be at the end times, that there will be persecution of the church. People are going to die for Jesus, and it happens more every year now. What can we do? What should be my response that in the world that I live in today and the Jesus I serve, that most people don't like him? They don't like his name. They don't like preaching about him. They don't like singing about him. That's the world we live in today. I want to read you a story that you may be familiar with. I've heard it, but I never read all the details of it. I saw it on the news. Many years ago, there was a movie that came out, and it was called Facing the Giants. And in that movie, it talked about how we had to stand up for Jesus and how we uh, had to, to stay firm in our belief in him. There was a football coach that read and he saw that movie. And that movie uplifted him and his relationship with the Lord like nothing else has. This is what he said. He said, I was crying my eyes out about that film while he watched it considering a coaching job at Berman High School in Seattle. It was clear sign that God was calling me to coach. I have never experienced that kind of effect in my life. I said, I'm all in God. I will give you the glory after every game right there in the field on the 50-yard line where we fight the battles. That's what he committed to God. As a coach, what he would do for his football team would play football in high school. They would march out to the 50-yard line. Those that wanted to, and sometimes either, even players from the other team would join him, and they would kneel before the ball game, and they would have prayer out there. Seven years, this was in 2015, 2015, they fired him. They fired him. It, it says in 2015, this is so sad, an opposing coach noticed them out on the field praying. He went and told the athletic director of the school that he ought not, his coach ought not to have those kids out there praying on the 50-yard line. So what happened? The, the athletic director suspended him for the rest of that season. The coach tried to do as instructed. He skipped the weekly prayer. After one game, he said, all right, I'll do it. I won't pray. One game, I'm just not going to do that. He said from the time he walked off that field all week long, he regretted the fact that he did not take his team out there and pray. He said, I regretted that. It said, even before, listen, he said, even before I went home, while I was on the way home from the football game, it was eating me up so bad that I turned my car around, went back to the football field, got out on the 50-yard line myself and prayed. 
That's quite a man there. So he resumed it. The next week before they had a game, he went out there, took his team out there, and prayed. The principal of the school said, you can't do that. You're on suspension until I tell you that you can come back and coach this ball team, if ever. Well, and it was come time to rehire at the school. They would not give him his job back. They fired him because he prayed. Now, listen to this. This is what got me when I read this story. Here was a man that spent 20 years in the Marines serving his country, and he was fired for 20 seconds of prayer. 20 years a Marine serving this nation, and for 20 seconds of prayer, he lost his job. That's an amazing thing in America, isn't it? It's an amazing thing. So, 2015, he sued the school district. School district fought it, and he sued them on the, that they were violating his religious freedom to pray. 2022, Supreme Court upheld him. Supreme Court took that case up in January 2022, and they ruled in the coach's favor. Thank God. Folks, I'm going to just be honest with you. I might need to cut this off. Like, my opinion, if it wasn't for the Supreme Court of this land making some of the decisions that they're making now, this land would be in the gutter worse than it is right now. That Supreme Court's the only thing holding our head above water right now with sin and all this stuff going on in the world. And that's just my opinion. That's what I feel. <laughs> right. And so... Whenever this happened and the Supreme Court ruled in his favor and his lawyer called and said, we've won the case. The Bible, he said that I just stood up and I gave a shout and I said, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. This is the point I'm trying to make. Christianity, as we move along in these latter days and the church, will be under a greater attack than we've ever seen the church under in our lifetime. It will become, we don't see it as much, but it is coming more and more. So what should be our response when the church is under attack, when the name of Jesus is under attack? What should be our response as Christian people for what we do? Well, I'll tell you what we need to do. Who said that? Stand up, just like that Marine did. Stand up and don't let them push us around because there may be more of them. They may have more money than we do, but they don't have a God like we do that doesn't need what they got. And that's, what we, that's how we respond. You see, one thing in America we take for granted We'll take it for granted until it's taken away from us. And that is religious liberty. To worship as we see fit, where we see fit. You do know that in many of the countries around the world, especially some of these where we talk about our missionary goes to, they're all over the place, but there are many places in this world where a whole country has no concept of what religious freedom is. They have no religious freedom. They will be killed. We supported many years ago a missionary and his wife and family in Afghanistan. We supported them just like we did here with a dollar a month. We, and when they'd come on home on furlough, he would come and speak to us at the church. There were times when it would get so rough in Afghanistan when he was there that they would have to leave the country, 
go to Kuwait or somewhere like that where it's peaceful until it all settled down and then they could go back into the country. He didn't go as a preacher. He had a medical consulting business. That's how he met people. That's how he led people to the Lord. That's how it was until it come one day when they told him don't go down in the market streets down there because if you go down there, they're going to probably kill you. He loaded his family up in the night, moved them out. Religious liberties. We left Afghanistan, and now they beat and kill Christians. Now they burn churches. Now they do not lie. He told me that if a plane at that time, and this has been a lot of years ago, flew into there, and they caught you with a Bible on that plane, they would put you back or put you in jail. They did not want a Bible in that land. So here in America, what we have done is oftentimes, I just, we don't understand what a country this is that we can come and worship anywhere we want to worship. We can worship anytime. Folks, do you understand that most of the world does not have that liberty like we do? And why do we have it? Because they were men and women like this coach that said, uh-uh, I'm going to have a right to pray. I'm going to have a right to read my Bible. I'm going to have a right to go to church where I want to go to church at. That should be the response of every person that is a Christian in America. So let me just hit this a little bit. That's what I believe. We have to stand up. I talked with a guy about a year ago. He was the head of one of the biggest companies in South Carolina. I know him well. We had lunch one day, and he told me, he said this. He said, I got a memo from the top that now in my place of work, I have to accept everybody that they send me. If I want to hire somebody, I've got to interview every kind of race, color, and creed, and everything that there is in the world. I cannot hire anybody until I do that. <laughs> I can't go into detail. I said, well, what would you do? He said, I interviewed them all, and then I hired the one I wanted to. And he said, this is what he told me. If they want to fire me, I'm not backing down on what I believe to keep this job here. How many people would say that? I'm not backing down on my Christian belief to satisfy the people up there if I don't agree and it violates my belief in God. I thought, wow. How many people of your power and authority when in America today, most of the corporations and companies are just the opposite from that. They're just the opposite from that. How can we stand up? Why? Why? What gives me, makes me want to feel like I need to stand up? And you're looking at the preacher, and I, I don't know how much, how much more time i got to do this, and, but that would be up to God. But I'm going to tell you something. I may not can preach very good, and I may not know very much, but I'm going to tell you what, I hope you pray that I'll always stand for the right thing and I will teach you the right thing and I won't follow along with what every other preacher in every other world and every other church is teaching, but we'll stand on the Word of God. That's what I want you to pray for me for. I don't want to bow down. The Bible says in Matthew 5, listen to what Jesus said. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, verse 10. Blessed are those that are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. To some, this may sound confusing. If we love God and He's all that we say it is, why should we have to undergo persecution if our God is who we say our God is? Jesus told us that we would be persecuted in this world. 
And he reminds us. And we sometimes need a reminder of this. That, in this, that we're to be in this world, but we're not to be of this world. Let's, let's don't, that's no light thing. But the reason the church is, folks, attendance is, is dying in the church. Most preachers would not believe what I'm about to say. And most preachers would never say what I'm about to say. But we have compromised the Bible and the beliefs of the Word of God to death in order to get along with a world that doesn't care about God. That's what the church has done. That's what we've done. Compromise. Every time I hear that word, I know there's some times that that needs to be, but it kind of sticks in my crawl when I hear it. We are members of the family of God. We are children of the greatest king that ever was and ever will be. We're his family. Psalms 56, 11 says this. In God I will put my trust, and I will not be afraid of what a man can do to me. I will put my trust in him, and I will not be afraid. If it comes from the corporate headquarters, so be it. But I'm going to put my trust in God, is what he says. Christians every day are persecuted around the world. Now, the right response to the world should be this. As the world falls further and further from God, those of us that are Christians, we ought to be drawing closer and closer to him. You see, in the world, because I look at some of the men in the Bible, some of the women in the Bible that face persecution, face death, Some years ago, remember, we looked at the life of Paul, didn't we? I don't know of many men other than Jesus Christ that suffered the, as Paul did. Remember when we talked about he was probably from the church, the first missionary that was ever sent out there to start and do the work of God in places where God was not at. But we have yet to understand in America Yet, but it's coming. The the reality of what Christian persecution is, but it's coming. The Apostle Paul, from the moment that he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior on that Damascus road, at that moment, his life literally almost became a hell on earth, didn't it? From that moment, he was under attack. Paul, he scaled the walls of a city in a basket to save his life. He was beaten. He was stoned. He was arrested. He was accused. He was shipwrecked. He was snake bitten. This man and all he wanted to do, but this is what I say about Paul. Through the midst of all the things that he suffered and went through, there was not one time he turned his back on God. Not one. Not one. All the way till Caesar in Rome. And we talked about that when I taught you that. You know this because I often will mention this. Paul and Silas. Y'all hear me talk about it. I love that story. I love that story. Over in the 16th chapter of Acts. Where they were beaten. You know... None of us really know the pain of serving Christ that some of these people have known. Paul was beaten, he was flogged, he was in prison, everything, and they beat his body, and they and yet when he went into that jail with Silas. 
And he was in there. I read some stuff that I did not know on this. Because just reading it in the book of Acts doesn't give you a, a total description of exactly what Paul and Silas went through because of their belief in God. Remember, before this happened, they threw Peter in jail and said what? If you preach about Jesus again, you'll be right back in here. That's exactly what they told him. We don't want you preaching in the name of Jesus. But this, I read this about the preacher. See, we, we, we know when I teach you this, or a preacher teaches that, that he was beaten and it was a